Well, I really grew up more in Alabama than Mississippi. Uh, I tell the story about Mississippi because that's where my people came from. They started out in Louisiana. They had a Katrina-type storm, just leveled everything. So everybody left Louisiana in the Baton Rouge area. They headed over to Mississippi. They thought they'd have a place to stay. But, you know, sometimes when those hurricanes come through, they get all large areas in Louisiana, large areas in Mississippi, and they carry right on through. So they wound up basically like um, gypsies wandering. They didn't own any property. They, everything they had was on their backs. And so they went from Louisiana to Mississippi to Alabama. My father had some relatives that he thought he could get a job. They would help him get a job there. Thank God he was right. That's where I was born. There are lots of things that I learned about my parents when I got older because my father began to abuse my mother. And when he abused my mother, it was a disaster. Uh, she became what you would call clinically depressed. The man whom she loved with all her heart was beating the shit out of her. And he, he seemed to be off, go crazy. And he didn't have restraints. The police had to come. And when the police came, it's like the whole neighborhood was astir. What on earth is going on in that house when otherwise they were a nice couple? They were young, they were handsome, they had two, uh, three, four kids. Nobody could quite understand why he went off the deep end. And it was liquor. He was an alcoholic. And the thing that flipped it for him was when my mother left him. Carnegie Mellon had a lot to offer. They had an outward-looking music department so that they encouraged me to go out and do professional jobs. And I did. I was very successful. And I've met, I went to Fred Rogers' church, Presbyterian church. They paid me very well as tenor soloist. And I made a proposal to do some um, American Negro spirituals for Easter, Good Friday. It, they, it was uh, to celebrate what they call the lessons, not lessons and carols, but Stations of the Cross. They loved it. And when it was over, it's like everyone lined up to come up and tell me how deeply touched they were by these songs. And I, I, I guess I was about to leave when... Joanne Rogers and John Lively was the name of the organist. I said, Francois, wait, 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 don't go. This is Fred Rogers. Well, I looked over there, and that was the plainest man you ever laid your eyes on. He, you know, he's not a showy person. And when I looked over there, I almost left. But I didn't want to be rude. I'm, you know, I'm not going to be rude. I said, well, hurry up and come over here and, and sing my praises so I can go. <laughs> I mean, it was that kind of cockiness. You're young. You know you did a good job. Everyone has told you that. And I just wanted these last few nice words so I could go and do something. He came over and he had such sincerity that you couldn't just be casual. You had to listen to what he had to say. And he said, I've been so touched by what you did today. Thank you very much. And he said, there's so many people here who have remarked about that quality that you brought when you're performing. And thank you very much. He said, I'd like to know more about you. Can we have lunch sometime or dinner? Well, my head was saying, a free, a free lunch? <laughs> Somebody else is going to pay for it. I'm in graduate school. I'm trying to make ends meet. And so that was it. He said, again, thank you very much. It was absolutely wonderful. And he left. That was it. I never fashioned under any circumstances that I would be on television. There was nowhere in my playbook that I thought of a 27, 28, 30-year career on television. However, the universe had another story for me because uh, I took it, I already had his card, and he said, call me up now. We want you to come over here and see us again soon. Well, I thought, shit, I'm over here at Carnegie Mellon. Well, I'm hot stuff in the opera department, and I'm doing this and singing with the orchestra and what have you. I really had no intention of ever going back. And he called me and left, a, I wasn't there, he left a message on my machine. Francois, where are you? You haven't come over to see us. We've been waiting for you. And I thought, what is wrong with him waiting for me? I'm doing my thing. 
I'm busy. Uh, I said, well, I waited two or three days, and I really felt guilty. He made me feel guilty. So I called him. I said, Mr. Rogers, this is uh, Francois Clemens. Yes, he said, I called you. I left a message. Why didn't you answer me and all that? I said, well, I don't know, but I, I'm, I'm here now. And he said, well, can you come over tomorrow? We'll be filming and blah, blah, blah. I said, well, yeah, I, I guess I can. Take some time from my routine and all that. Well, I was thinking about all that. I went over, and once again, he was so nice. And he introduced me to people whom I didn't know, more people who were actually the film crew and the people involved in the studio. And after I met them and stuff, uh, we sat, like you and I, we chatted. This time when he said, now we want you to come over here again, friends. We want to see what we're doing. And uh, maybe one day you'll come here and sing some songs. Oh, I thought that was just a lovely thing. You know, but that's it. That's all I thought. I wasn't thinking about long term. So I said, well, thank you very much. That's really nice. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go now. And I left with the idea, loose ends. I got a phone call. It says, I want to send you a, a script or two. And you, would you sing like Swing Low, Sweet Chariot and maybe My Lord, What a Morning or A Balm and Gilead. He named a couple of spirituals. He, knew, he knows the repertoire. So I thought, well, that, yeah, that'll be easy for me. So that's what I wound up doing. I went over. Uh, I wore whatever I wanted to wear, and Francois Clemens sang a couple of spirituals for Fred Rogers. Well, uh, I guess two weeks later or something like that, I got a phone call again. He said, my goodness, Francois, we have got such a positive response already. He said, we barely showed the show. So he says, would you like to come on again? I'll never forget. Uh, I went over to the studio. I said, I need to talk with you, Mr. Rogers about your offer to be on the show, this thing and everything. He said, yes, we are very excited. And I said, Mr. Rogers? I called him Mr. Rogers then. I'd be very happy to be on your television program as long as it doesn't interfere with my singing. I felt it was important for me to tell him that because I did not foresee a career at children's television. And I've said this so many times. That was the dumbest thing I've ever said. It was so dumb because Fred's <laughs> interest in me and love for me made my career. <laughs> There's so many places that I sang, so many places that I went. I never would have gone had it not been for Mr. Rogers. I was just naive. It was the truth, I told him. And so years, not too much later, but years later, he would tease me all the time. But, uh, Officer Clemens, we'd be in a dressing room or in a studio. I said, yes. He said, are we interfering with your career? <laughs> That was his sense of humor. I think it's important for people to know that we did not agree on the role that being gay should play. However, he held all the trump cards. He had all the money. And he was the creator of the show and had the idea, the creative idea. And he felt that if he had an openly gay person on the show, he would lose Sears and Heinz and Johnson and Johnson. It was a very practical thing that he was asking. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that he would lose his program. That was his dream. I don't think I have had a right to ask him to risk losing his dream. For what? Uh, I'm one person. I was not even a seasoned actor at the time. What did I have to offer? So I, the more I thought about that, the less I, I, I did not feel any resentment that way. And it was also two or, two or three other things. One was, he told me, I still want you in my life. I heard that. He was a man who made a commitment to me, and he kept that commitment. That was probably more important to me in some ways because he had begun to become like a surrogate father. There were things that I needed on a human, spiritual, emotional level, and he was there for me. One day, um, we were going out to Los Angeles or Portland, on the west, west Coast, to perform. And I said, Fred, I'd like to, when we leave Seattle, fly back to uh, Houston and then over to um, Atlanta or something like that and go to Tuscaloosa and see my father. Oh, you're ready, huh? I said, yes. I want, but I wanted to make sure I could do that, and then I'll give him a call. He said, I think it's a wonderful idea. So he prompted me to, to get ready 
to, to have that occasion. They came and got me at the airport, and I just, I felt it was so wonderful. And as soon as I saw him, I saw myself. I, I can't tell you the feeling was just so. It, it, something happens inside of you. And so for the first time in my life, I had this feeling, only thing I can tell you is like, you can't tell me to get out. I'm, I'm yours. This is, I never had that feeling before. This is where I belong. We talked and he said, you know, I'm grateful that you have forgiven me for what I did. I didn't mean to do it, but I was young and inexperienced. He was a, a changed man. And I'm very, very happy that Fred encouraged me to go because then I said to him, I have something to tell you. He said, yes. I said, I'm gay. And if you can handle it, fine. If you can't, I'll never come back. I said, what does that have to do with a father and a son, that you're gay? He said, if you are gay, that's all right with me. He said, and I, I want you to know, if you ever have a lover or someone who loves you, they're always welcome in my home. He says, if you find someone in this life who loves you, consider yourself lucky. I wrote the book because I didn't have a role model. And I want kids who are growing up now, first of all, to realize that they are lovable, that they, have, they can have brilliance, they can have mediocrity, or they can be plain. But I wanted people to know that a gay person hung in there. I've got grit. And I know I do. And I want people who, who read this story to understand what it, what it means to have grit, not give up.